welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. Today, I'll be talking about diagnostic stewardship in community acquired pneumonia with syndromic molecular testing. And I picked this study because as I was looking for an article, I have always found it interesting to compare what the US does compared to other countries. And this article kind of captures some of that, as well as kind of explore the different modalities of technology that can be used to help us better care for our patients in the emergency department. And so with that being said, we'll start with some background information to kind of frame everything into context. And it all begins with respiratory infections being a huge burden to the emergency department. With over 4.7 million respiratory infection related visits in 2021, and that's that was from the COVID era. And so today I imagine that number is even higher than was originally reported. Additionally, there's an estimated 1.5 million hospitalizations every single year for community-acquired pneumonia, and unfortunately, this does result in just under 42,000 deaths in the U.S. every single year. And so we can see the substantial prevalence that respiratory infections have, specifically in the emergency department, but more broadly on the healthcare system as well. Now, when I think of pneumonia, I immediately begin to stratify it into either community-acquired or hospital-acquired based on where we think the infection originated from. And this ultimately changes what pathogens we are concerned about. So for community-acquired, things like streptococcus, respiratory viruses, and atypical bacteria. Whereas with hospital-acquired, we're more worried about staphylococcus like MRSA and pseudomonas. But When we actually look at the etiology of the pathogens behind community-acquired pneumonia, the data is rather sparse. Bacteria only actually accounts for up to 16% if you include those polymicrobial infections in green there. And in the magenta, we see that 61% of the time, no pathogen is ever identified, which I'm sure leaves you with all a lot of questions, but also leaves me with some, like what makes up that 61%? Do those patients even need antibiotics? And I think in order to answer those questions, we first have to ask why we're not detecting a pathogen in those 61% of patients. And in order to answer that, we have to look toward the guidelines. So the guidelines I'm referring to are the American Thoracic Society and the Infectious Disease Society of America. They published their Community Acquired Pneumonia Guidelines in 2019. And in these guidelines, they recommend only attaining a gram stain and culture in adult patients managed in the hospital setting if they have severe enough illness, have any sort of MRSA or pseudomonal concern, or any recent hospitalizations with IV antibiotics in the last 90 days. And the guidelines kind of explain their stance by saying that there is difficulty in collecting and evaluating sputum culture data, which completely makes sense. And there's also a lack of evidence out there supporting sputum collection on patient-specific clinical outcomes. But yet they still conclude this section by highlighting the need for rapid, sensitive, and cost-effective diagnostic tools to identify pathogenic organisms in community-acquired pneumonia. And this makes sense to me because when we look at pathogen identification on a broad scale, We see that pathogen identification leads to facilitated treatments targeting the specific organisms causing the infection, which will in turn reduce unnecessary antibiotics, either through narrowing spectrum of the antibiotics or potential removal of antibiotics altogether. Additionally, pathogen identification has been suggested to shorten length of stay. That's from de-escalation of antibiotics from broad spectrum to more narrow, potentially oral options. And it can even have benefits that are maybe hard to quantify in the forms of publication, things like monitoring of epidemiology data and resistance patterns that could influence treatment decisions through antibiogram development. Now, I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with what the guidelines say for community-acquired pneumonia treatment, but just as a brief refresher, those non-severe inpatient admissions are typically going to be utilizing a beta-lactam and macrolide. And at my institution, we're frequently using ceftriaxone and azithromycin. 
but I'm sure others may use ampicillin sobactam or other empiric agents. Alternatively, we can use respiratory fluoroquinolone like levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. And then in those non-severe patients, we're adding on MRSA or pseudomonal coverage only if indicated. Conversely, with our severe inpatient emissions, we still use the beta-lactam and macrolide approach, but can also use beta-lactam and fluoroquinolones. And I think in my experience, and I'm sure a lot of you might agree, that we are frequently having empiric MRSA and pseudomonal coverage through fipronil and tazobactam or vancomycin, and are peeling those off as we're able to, either with mercenaries or whatever other tests, we can get, uh, convince the team to peel those off. Now, these guidelines are pretty broad. We're using some pretty broad antibiotics here empirically. And I wanted to compare this to the Norway Empiric Community Acquired Pneumonia Guidelines. And I didn't just pick this randomly. It's where the study that we'll be talking about momentarily takes place. And in Norway, they utilize the CRB65 scoring tool, which uh, is a scoring tool that ranges from zero to four points. And ultimately, each criteria is just a single point, And the C stands for confusion. R for respiratory rate, B for blood pressure less than 90 over 60, and C for greater than or equal to 65 years of age. Based on this scoring tool, they then get stratified to severity with a score of zero to two being mild to moderate. And in that case, they recommend just penicillin for that empiric community acquired pneumonia treatment. Then for patients with a score of three to four, they are classified as severe or very severe, and then it gets further distinguished into where they are located in the hospital. If they're in the non-ICU setting, then it's still the penicillin with a one-time dose of gentamicin. And then in the ICU, they're utilizing cefotaxime and ciprofloxacin. And they're able to do this because less than 1% of streptococcus isolates in Norway are resistant to penicillins, which is really neat. But in the U.S., we don't have that luxury. Unfortunately, the CDC reports streptococcus resistance rates as high as 40% in the U.S. to at least one antibiotic. Now, the Norwegian guidelines don't just end there. They actually go on to further identify specific antibiotic recommendations for some of those commonly found pathogens in community-acquired pneumonia. Things like penicillin still for pneumococcal infections. For haemophilus, they recommend ampicillin for mycoplasma, clorithromycin, Legionella, ciprofloxacin, et cetera. And this is important when we actually get to our study because one of the primary outcomes is pathogen-directed treatment. And so these are what the authors were looking for in order to determine whether or not they were attaining pathogen-directed treatment, either one of these four specific recommendations or just continuation of the empiric recommendations. So that was a lot of background information, I know. But when, as we turn our presentation here to look at the actual study done by Mark Husson and his colleagues that was published in March of this year in JAMA. We have diagnostic stewardship in community-acquired pneumonia with syndromic molecular testing. And the aim of this study is to determine if the use of a PCR-based panel for community-acquired pneumonia in the emergency department leads to faster, more accurate treatment. It was a single center, prospective, blinded, randomized control trial that was performed in the emergency department of Hockland University Hospital, located in Bergen, Norway. It had two enrollment periods to capture different seasons where respiratory conditions tend to be a little bit more frequent. That was in 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022. As for the patients that were included in the study, they looked at patients with suspected community-acquired pneumonia that were at least 18 years of age and had at least two of a variety of common pneumonia symptoms, things like new or worsening cough, new or worsening shortness of breath, fever, or any sort of radiologic evidence of pneumonia. Then they excluded all of the patients that might have a complicated pneumonia picture, things like cystic fibrosis, uh, any sort of recent hospitalizations uh, prior to admission, and an unwillingness of the patient to provide a lower respiratory tract sample. Now, for the primary outcomes, we again have pathogen-directed treatment and time to pathogen-directed treatment. And for our secondary outcomes, they had any antibiotics, narrow-spectrum antibiotics, de-escalation, escalation, duration of antibiotics, and then some patient-specific factors like length of stay, mortality at 30 and 90 days, and readmission within 30 days. So they had a whole bunch of secondary outcomes. But I think what's most important from this slide to take away is broad-spectrum antibiotics and how they defined that. 
which they define broad spectrum as being penicillin with enzyme inhibitors. So things like piperacillin tazobactam or ampicillin solbactam, which I think makes sense. But they also included second and third gen cephalosporins. So even things like cetriaxone that we're pretty empirically starting here in the U.S. is considered broad spectrum to them. They're also considering carbapenems and quinolones, which makes sense. Now, for the statistical analysis, they had two primary outcomes. So the p-value was set to 0.025. This was powered to detect a 25% increase in pathogen-directed treatment and a 20% reduction in time to pathogen-directed therapy. So in total, they had estimated about 470 patients needed per arm with a 10% dropout rate that gave them a total N of about 1,060 patients. Now, unfortunately, the trial was stopped early, and so they were only able to screen about 2,265 patients, of which the majority were excluded, and that left them with 374 patients that were randomized to either receive rapid PCR tests with the standard of care versus just standard of care. And so they had 187 patients per arm. Now, my first question was, what was the standard of care that they're referring to? And it refers to a lower respiratory tract sample that's collected in the ED and used for sputum culture data. So it was a sputum induction through either nebulized isotonic or hypertonic saline. And in some cases, they did use endotracheal aspiration through bronchoalveolar lavage. And then it had additional testing with blood cultures, pneumococcal urine tests, and an in-house PCR nasal swab that tested for DNA from viruses and atypical bacteria. Now, the intervention group was that PCR-based test, and the study used this BioFire Pneumonia Plus panel. And it tested for those same viruses and atypical pathogens, but it also tested for the 11 different gram-negative species and four different gram-positive species as well as a series of resistance genes, some carbapenemases, CTXM, and methicillin resistance. And we also found out in the supplemental information that the turnaround time for this pneumonia plus panel is about two hours. And in comparison, the standard of care took around 48 hours because of some of that culture data. But interestingly, it doesn't uh, just stop there in terms of their standard of care because the hospital that it was done at also has this clinical relevance message that pops up on all sputum results and also in the case of the PCR testing. And this clinical relevance message nudges the providers to whether or not the pathogen that was detected is actually pathogenic. And so things like viruses or atypical bacteria would be always pathogenic whereas some other bugs like streptococcus are usually pathogenic. Things like Klebsiella and Staphylococcus are usually not pathogenic in their eyes. And then all other bacteria that were identified, so like E. coli, Proteus, and Pseudomonas, were considered rare pathogens. And the rare pathogens had a little asterisk next to it because it also alerted providers to only consider those pathogenic in the setting of immunosuppressed patients or previously had antibiotic exposure. Then when we get to the results of the study, again, I did mention that the trial was stopped early due to an interim analysis that was conducted because of the slow enrollment. It was done on June, I believe it was 16th, 2022. And yeah, they they conducted that, did the interim analysis, found statistical significance, and decided to end the trial early at that point. And so if we look at the baseline demographics of the two groups, we see that these are kind of our run-of-the-mill, I think, medicine-level patients. They're typically, you know, 60s to 70s, predominantly male, about 20% of them were current smokers, about half of them had a comorbid respiratory illness or baseline disease, about 10% of them were immunocompromised. When looking at the baseline characteristics, we see again, uh, these patients aren't necessarily the ICU level of uh, sick patients, but more of our medicine level patients because they were just on the kind of upper ranges of normal in terms of temperature, pulse rate a little bit elevated respiratory rate, same with white count, and nearly all of them did have a chest x-ray done. As for the primary outcome, we see that pathogen-directed treatment occurred in about 35% of those patients in the PCR group compared to about 13% in those standard of care. And this was determined by two of the authors that went through retrospectively and determined based on the guidelines from Norway and whether or not the notes or the data that they had available to them from the electronic medical record uh, denoted that antibiotics were changed because of the result of the testing. 
And so this was statistically significant, as well as time to pathogen directed therapy, which occurred in about 34 and a half hours in the PCR group, compared to about 42.8 hours in the standard of care group. And for both of these outcomes, if there is any sort of discrepancy between the two authors that went through it retrospectively and reviewed all of the data, the third author on the paper did go ahead and adjudicate those results. Now, they did do a subgroup analysis looking at patients just with confirmed community-acquired pneumonia. So if we remember the inclusion criteria was all patients with suspected pneumonia, but then based on retrospective review by the authors, again, they determined whether or not the patient actually had community-acquired pneumonia. That left 97 patients in the PCR group and 103 patients in the standard of care group. And we see that pathogen-directed therapy, when they did this subgroup analysis, was actually even more uh, different, with about 47% in the PCR group compared to about 15% in the standard of care group. Then they further broke this down into what type of pathogen-directed treatment occurred, whether it be continuation of appropriate empiric antibiotics, escalation, de-escalation, or initiation. And we see that the largest difference was really found in that escalation category from narrow spectrum to more broad spectrum antibiotics. And I think this made sense to me because of how narrow their empiric guidelines actually are, and that the only difference between the standard of care and the PCR group was really for those resistance genes, the carbapenemases, CTXM, and ethicillin resistance, as well as the 11 species of gram-negative and five species of gram-positive organisms. And so with that being the only difference, it makes sense that they would see the biggest difference in escalation of therapy. As for the clinical outcomes, they did not see any sort of difference in terms of readmission rate, 30, 90-day mortality, or length of stay. And what I'm presenting here is for the entire population that they evaluated, but even when they did the subgroup analysis on those confirmed with community-acquired pneumonia, there was no difference found there either. Now, as far as the author's conclusion goes, they did say that pathogen-directed therapy increased by 30% and time was decreased by about nine and a half hours, which is great. They set out what they were intending to do with their specific aim. The strengths of the study were that it had two enrollment periods to capture two different sort of respiratory illness seasons, a pretty broad inclusion criteria, and that the authors were not actually involved in the study. They just kind of did it retrospectively but the study still enrolled kind of uh, proactively. And then uh, as far as limitations go, it was a single center trial and it was ultimately stopped early due to their little interim ad hoc analysis. So basically they weren't recruiting fast enough, analyzed the data and found that difference and then stopped the trial afterwards. And so my thoughts regarding this publication is first and foremost, that pathogen directed treatment is pretty rare in community acquired pneumonia. And we saw that first with the etiologic data from the background information that the majority of the time we're not having pathogens detected in the majority of community-acquired pneumonia. But even with this PCR, it only happened about 35% of the time and up to like 47% of the time if the patient had confirmed community-acquired pneumonia. I do recognize and uh, appreciate the substantial time difference that was found in pathogen identification, and I think that part makes a lot of sense if we're able to get data back faster. I mean, why not? Especially with a quick turnaround time of only two hours for this PCR-based test compared to up to two days and sometimes even longer in terms of our sputum and blood cultures. Now, the majority of the difference was found in escalation of antibiotics, and again, this is likely due to low antibiotic resistance in Norway as well as their narrow treatment guidelines. And so, you know, if you were to re redo this trial here in the U.S., I can't imagine we would have that be the case. I imagine it would be kind of the opposite, either de-escalation or probably no difference in escalation because of how broad our empiric guidelines are with the beta-lactam and macrolide initially. Also, Norway has a pretty robust standard of care, and the intervention only really changed that bacteria identification and those resistance genes. So I thought that was the strength of the study, having that robust standard of care, though I do think the comment of clinical relevance message could have potentially skewed the data in, in favor of potentially undertreating. I, I think I'd have a pretty hard time convincing providers, at least where I've practiced, to not treat a pseudomonal infection or a, a pseudomonal sputum culture that uh, popped positive. 
And then my last thought was just in terms of like implementing this in my practice or in the emergency department, I imagine one of the challenges would be to induce sputum production or perform bronchoalveolar lavage in a lot of these patients and the time that it would take. I think some things might have to change procedurally in order to allow for the uh, quick collection and turnaround time uh, in order to get that test and those results back in a time efficient manner. And so that concludes today's journal club. I'll take any sort of questions anyone has. I do have some citations there on the last slide, but yeah, let me know what you all think or if you have any questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion journal articles and emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest. It should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.